um, we're trying to look for suitable timbers. So this is a piece of cherry, um, but you can use cherry, you can use birch, Thank you can you. use Thank you, you can much. use willow. Um, I tend to avoid timbers like we've got ash in the woods next door. I try and avoid ring porous timbers like ash and oak and things like that because you'll find that they will have very open early growth rings which are like sort of drinking straws almost like a, a stick of celery and they'll absorb a lot of food as you're using it and uh, they don't tend to look very nice after a while. So dense hardwoods, try and avoid sort of semi-toxic timbers like some people will use laburnum and things like rhododendron and things like that but they have got quite a bit of toxicity in them so try and try and use sort of uh, nice dense food safe timbers my personal preference is sycamore and birch it does give quite a pale finish when you've finished your spoon but it's very uh, sort of quick growing it's a pioneer species in the, in the, in the wood so if you cut it down you're not going to be cutting down anything too special and it gives a really nice clean grain as well so you get a lot of nice cuts on it. So when you're selecting your piece of timber you want to try and avoid sections that have got knots and branches in it because that's just going to be very very swirly grain. You're looking for a clean section of timber and this would probably be a sort of ideal section of timber for a spoon because you've got a straight section and then a little bit of curved grain here where our bowl of our spoon is going to go. So what I'd do is I'd cut that off with a saw and then I would orientate that piece of wood so that I'm utilising that curve if it has got a slight curve in it and then I would split that piece of timber at least in half through what we call the pith which is the very centre of the tree, the very dot in the middle and we would split that into two equal halves. Now the reason why we split that is that if we left green wood in the round in a complete circle like that as it dries you can probably see it's already started to crack you get these radiating cracks now a lot of people think oh you can't carve green wood because it always cracks as it dries that's normally because they haven't split the piece of timber effectively what you've got in a piece of wood is you've got growth rings that are literally connected like that and as wood dries it has to change shape it has to distort and effectively and in order to it for it to shrink those growth rings have to break at one point and that is the crack that it creates so if you can split it in a controlled manner at the beginning you won't have any problem with cracking it will just slightly distort okay so what we're going to do we've split that we've done our axe work and we've removed all our heavy waste amounts of material and we've got something that crudely looks like our spoon and we'll lift off from there and we'll show you a few of the, the knife brushes that we use. So knife wise, you want to try and use the shortest knife possible for the task that you're doing. So obviously if you're carving a very delicate little uh, yogurt spoon or something, you want to try and use a much smaller knife. If you're carving a canoe paddle, then you're probably going to need a blade that's slightly longer. But effectively what you're looking for is to try and have no more of the blade sticking out beyond the piece of wood than possible. Obviously if I've got a five inch knife and I'm whittling here, there's more tendency for that extra bit of blade that's sticking out to catch my fingers. So a three inch blade for a sort of spoon of about that size is going to be ideal. Now I normally sit down when I'm whittling because it's just nicer. Do you want to sit here? No, no, I'm good. I'm going to stand up because it's less aggravated on the back anyway. But the tendency is, the big mistake people make when they sit around the campfire whittling, which is probably the best thing to do at an event like this, is they tend to sit and they whittle in between their, their legs because it's sort of comfortable. But one false move with a knife and you've got some pretty major arteries running on the inside of your legs and it's sort of bad practice to get into. So what I tend to teach people to do is sort of almost sit side saddle and you can support this arm that's holding your spoon on your thigh. So if you're right handed you'll be working out this way, if you're left handed you'll be working out the other way. And one of the sort of four, first grips that we will use for heavy stock removal is what we call the forehand grip. And that's where we hold the knife in a conventional manner with the cutting edge pointing away from ourselves. And what we can do is we can use this for removing big bulks of material. Um, and you tend to just slice away from yourself like that using the whole of your arm. Now to improve that grip straight array, 
straight away, rather than just pushing straight with the knife, if you crank your wrist so that you angle the blade, you will increase the efficiency of that knife and it will slice cleaner through the wood, you'll get much curlier shavings and you'll find that you have to put very, very little effort into that cut. So that's the forehand grip. If I was sitting down, it would be easier to show you that you can again improve the efficiency of it by rather than just using your elbow and your forearm, you use the whole of your upper arm and you effectively lift your shoulder and then you drop your shoulder like so. And it looks a little bit bizarre, but after a while, you'll find that it's very efficient and you can do that pretty much all day without getting tennis elbow. Okay, so in by angling the blade and using your shoulder muscles, you're going to improve that, that grip. The only disadvantage I find with that forehand grip, if you're trying to remove heavy amounts of material, is it's a long way away. And if you've got a design that you've drawn on, it's difficult to see what you're doing. So my preferred grip is what we call the chest lever grip. And to do that, what we do is we allow the blade and the knife to swivel in our hands so the cutting edge is coming back towards us. And then we lift both items up into our, into our sight, into our vision and we tuck them underneath our heart, underneath our chest muscles and we're going to create a little cross, like a little scissor and then what we're going to do is we're going to tuck our elbows back engage that cut and in order to get that to cut what we do is we try and push our shoulders back together so they're touching you're almost doing sort of like a chicken impression really <laughs> um, the great thing about that is you've got a hell of a lot of control you can see what I'm doing but the real beauty is if you sat around whittling with your mate right next to the side of you, that knife never moves more than about three inches. With that forehand grip, you tend to be flying off the end and it almost in an uncontrolled manner. Whereas this is a much more controllable way of whittling. And even though you can remove heavy amounts of material, you can actually remove very, very little pieces of material as well. So if you're trying to do a very delicate cut, it works really nicely. If you've got a sharp point to your spoon, I try and make sure that I whittle that back off because a lot of the grips we tend to be pushing against our chest, so you want to try and avoid any sharp edges to start with. So that's the forehand grip and the chest lever grip that we use, or the scissor grip. Another grip that we will tend to use for a controlled way of cutting is to hold the knife again in the forehand grip, but this time we're just going to use the thumb of our hand that's holding the spoon to apply pressure on the back edge of that knife and the safety with that is that the knife only travels the amount of distance that that thumb can move so this is quite a nice little cut so that we can work on the back of our spoon in a very controlled manner i'll just call it the thumb grip so i literally just push on the back of the back of the knife the only way that you can improve that cut is rather than just pushing like so what we do is we almost keep our thumb fixed and we swivel this hand so then it creates just a fulcrum point and you can use that to actually increase the slicing efficiency of your knife and you get a much smoother finish. You'll have to avoid the, uh, excuse this hole we've already got, this is had too many demos already look so um, yeah it's already got a hole in but Colander. That, it, wasn't, it wasn't sort of uh, intentional. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's quite a good grip for the back of the, the bowl and also for smoothing off the back of the, the handle and things like that. One of the main things that people do when they're whittling is they have a tendency when they're trying to work around this curve, they have this bad habit of using their thumb as a backstop. So they'll start cutting back towards themselves and they'll just cut straight into their pad of their thumb, which is bad news really. So if I am going to be working around this direction to try and work with the grain direction of my spoon, what I do is I always make sure that I keep that thumb tucked well out the way and I'm only using the sort of leverage of my fingers and as soon as they come to the end of their stroke that knife not travelling any further than it can, it basically hits that little uh, crotch in my uh, thumb and forefinger. Once you get to about halfway coming around the bowl of the spoon like so, the grain direction changes. So you can either turn it over and do the same cut but often you can't see the design that you're working on so I'll use that thumb grip that I used earlier just to work on that side. That way I can work towards a pencil line. Okay, So you can flip those around. The other thing that's a difficult area 
is this transition point. So normally what happens when people are carving a spoon, they make this very square cut between the bowl and the stem. And if you've got a very short distance that the grain changes direction, you'll find it really difficult to clean up. So try and have nice sweeping curves. And in order to clean up that, I would use two different grips. So if we're working in this direction, I would support it against my chest and I would either use my fingers of this hand to apply pressure on the back edge of the knife, like so, so it's literally using those fingers again to push, or I don't need to use those fingers, but the main thing with this, the safety factor of working back towards yourself, is you always point the tip of the knife away from yourself and keep your arms and your hand very close to your body. And the safety is the fact that as soon as I get to the end of the stroke, my hand and my arm hit my body and that's the stop. If I've got them away from my body, there's nothing to stop that knife travelling back in towards my chest. So keep your arms tight in your body, and you can work back towards the bowl or the spoon. Just until you get to the point where it starts to cut up grain. So this is where the grain starts to change direction, so I can turn it round, and I can use that grip where I push with my fingers, and it allows me to steer the blade round the bend and get that really nice smooth transition. <coughs> and then we use a sort of combination of those grips that we've already shown you to work with the grain direction. The biggest skill with spoon carving or any kind of wood carving is, is understanding grain direction. Now grain direction is literally like contour lines on a map. If you try and imagine it that these are our hills and these are our valleys, you always want to work from the top of the hill to the valley floor. If you try and work from the valley floor upwards, you'll always be cutting up against those fibres, a bit like catching your sort of fingernails, it's sort of tearing at it. So as long as you always work from high to low, you're always going to end up with a really nice smooth cut. And that's the way of sort of looking at it really. And try and make as long a cuts as possible. If you can get really nice long shavings you're going to end up with lots of nice smooth facets to your spoon or your wood carving. If you try and make tiny little nibbles it'll look like it's been uh, sort of chewed away by a little beaver or something. So you want to try and get nice long sweeping cuts. So at about that stage and obviously this would be green at about this stage and you'd find that when you're working it if you've got manual workers hands your lovely white sycamore or birch spoon would be black like this so i'd get to the stage where it's pretty much roughed out and then we get to the stage where we need to hollow the bowl of the spoon so in order to hollow the bowl of the spoon you need at least, at least one uh, curved or what we call a crook knife or a spoon knife and this is effectively uh, like a, a gouge, but rather than holding a gouge with a long handle out of here, we've got a handle coming out 90 degrees to it. And it's <coughs> perfectly designed for hollowing out the bowl of a spoon or making cups or bowls. The secret with this is to choose your dominant hand to start with. So if you're a right-handed person, you can get a right-handed cook knife. And then what you want to do is you want to work across the grain so it's less likely to catch the grain direction and you always want to make sure that this thumb again is tucked well out the way. I tend to use this technique which I call an open open fist grip so I grip the crook knife with my fingers like that and what I do is I clench my fist and what that does is it scribes an arc which is going to create the perfect curve to the bowl of our spoon but it also swings that cutting edge up and away from my thumb. If I just pull straight across it'll cut into myself. So make sure that I use that open fist grip and I work across the grain and up. And try and always make sure that you continue that cut all the way through. There's a tendency when people learn spoon carving is they do a cut from this side and they stop in the same place every time and you end up with like a ridge in the middle. So try and sweep that cut all the way through and out the other side. What's the, what are the best size for the spoon? The best size You'll be surprised, even this is too big for an eating spoon. Okay. 
Okay. So really, you'll be surprised how small a good eating spoon has to be. Like if you pick up a, a favourite one that you've got in your cutlery drawer at home, a metal one, and actually look at it, the size of it, and even use that as a template to draw on your no, bit of No, I don't mean the hollow, I actually mean the, 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 the knife. The crook knife. Yeah. It's the kind of thing when you're learning, if you try and go straight in and use a massive you'll find that you get really fatigued really quickly because you're trying to remove lots of material all, all at once. So I tend to choose something that's got nothing more than about an inch diameter radius. So that's almost perfect, like almost the size of your, your thumb really, something like that. You can always do bigger projects with a small knife, but you can't do a small project with a big knife. Um, and when you're learning, if you're taking small little nibbles of, of wood out of your uh, carving project, you're not going to get tired at all really, it's going to be a very easy sort of bit of width. Um, if you find that the wood starts to dry out, you know, if you started carving it and it starts to get a bit harder and a bit drier, then just stop for a bit, chuck it in a bucket of water, let it soak. Sometimes if it really dries out, you know, this is like 12 months old now and it's really dry, it might take a couple of days for it to rehydrate, but it'll get nice and wet and soft again, it'll be easy to carve. I used to just get spoons to a certain stage, then dry out, I'd get bored how hard they were to carve and I'd just chuck them on the fire, but you can always rehydrate timber, that's what's great about it. So using a crook knife like that, you'll be able to hollow it away. The main thing to do is constantly keep feeling the thickness and make sure that you're not making it too thin in one spot. Hold it up to the sunlight, make sure that you can't see it glowing. And if you see a hole appear like we've got in this one, then you, what you were intending it to be was a spoon for getting your boiled eggs out of the water so that they're, they're drained. So um, just change the design, you know, if it all goes horribly wrong. Okay, so you'd use the crook knife for just whittling away. Some people still struggle. Um, with that transition, that, that, that area between the bowl of the spoon and the, the neck and the stem of the spoon. So you can use flatter crook knives for hollowing it out and you can also use the flatter crook knives for smoothing up that area as well. I find that people get more success being able to sweep those, those curved blades around those bends. So that works quite nicely. And then when it comes to finishing off, I'll try and get people to use, again, a smaller blade as possible. So these little one and a half inch blades with very narrow depth to the blade are perfect for getting smooth cuts on this area. And if you want to do lips or bits of detail on the ends of your spoon, it allows you to swivel it round and get these nice little bits of detail carved in really quite easily so you can make them as symmetrical as you want. And obviously the smaller the blade is, the less likely you are to cut yourself. That's the great thing about it. The other thing that I like to do when I've finished a spoon is to put my maker's mark on the back. So again, the advantage of this is I can hold this by the tip like a, like a pencil and I can cut in. First of all, I tend to cut in about 90 degrees and then I come 45 degrees to the side of it, about a mil away from that first line slice right to the bottom of that gap, turn it round and come back the other way. The temptation is to, if you're sat down, to, to lean it on your thigh, but don't do that, just put it on a, on a chopping block and then you can slice in and you can just put those little marks. It's quite nice to, you know, if you're giving a spoon away as a gift, it's quite nice to put somebody else's name in it or if it's their birthday, you can carve the date of birth in or something like that. But it just removes a little channel of timber. So that's the start of my, my letter B that I carve in the back of the spoons. I, uh, I, I, I sort of hate the fact that I've got a curved, curved lines on the whole of my initials, so I tend to end up doing sort of gothic, gothic-esque letters. So they're a bit sort of straighter. So I start to carve it in like so. And then once you've roughed it out, and like I say, you'll probably find that it gets quite grubby, quite dirty. Once you're happy with the, the overall shape and you've pretty much removed all the bulk of the material, just let it dry out completely for a few days. The thinner it is, the quicker it will dry, but don't try and speed it up by putting it in the oven or anything, because you are running the risk of cracking it. 
and then when it's completely dry and you'll, you'll, you'll sort of hear that it's dry because it'll have uh, a good ring to it you can then just very gently go over it taking a very small slither of timber off all the way around and you'll get this real crisp smooth finish that you can get from a really sharp knife on dry timber I don't tend to use sandpaper so I'm looking to get just the pure finish straight off the knife and that's what you'll get with a nice dry bit of timber and a, a, a sharp tool. If you want to sand any of it you could sometimes just get a very fine grade of sandpaper and just sand the very inside of the bowl of the spoon just so that it makes it a bit more tactile when you're eating with it. And then to seal it you want to use um, an edible oil really, you don't want to use um, like linseed oil or yacht varnish from your local hardware store. You can either use a bit of extra virgin olive oil, you can use uh, sort of vegetable oil, you can use walnut oil, that's really good. But the only trouble is, again, is if you're giving it away as a gift and you don't know if they've got a nut allergy or anything like that, you're not going to be best of friends, are you? Um, the safest one to go for is food grade linseed oil which you can normally pick up small bottles from uh, your, your local uh, whole food shop and the advantage with the linseed oil is that it doesn't go uh, sticky with use you know if you're washing it up constantly some of the vegetable oils tend to go a little bit sticky and a bit tacky the linseed oil sets after a few days um, it smells a bit like window putty when you first put it on um, but it cures and it won't go rancid it won't go sticky you can use it on cooks, yeah. You can use it on anything, really. Some people mix it, warm it, mix it with a bit, bit, bit of beeswax. I just tend to put it on warm. And I found that it smells a bit stronger if you sort of warm it, mix, use a bit of it, and then warm it again. It sort of like condenses it a little bit. So I just tend to put it on cold, really. You can warm the spoon slightly so that it absorbs it a little bit easier. But if you apply it and then rub it in with your hands, sometimes the warmth from your hand is enough to make it sort of uh, viscous enough so that it, it, it penetrates the wood a little bit. But one thing to remember if you have used linseed oil and you've applied it and you've wiped off the excess with a cloth, don't just screw up that cloth and chuck it in the back of the workshop because as it dries it, it creates quite a lot of heat and it, can, it actually can combust so I either spread the rag out in the workshop or chuck it in a metal dustbin and actually set fire to it so there's no, no fear of it catching fire um, and that's pretty much it really um, what you will find that once you start carving and you start making spoons you end up with shavings like that everywhere from in your boots to your belly button and certainly on your carpet um, but you know if it all goes horribly wrong and you end up with a spoon with a hole in and a pile of shavings you've got some elaborate kindling um, and you've still had a bit of fun and it hasn't cost you any money um, I think the reason why spoon carving is becoming so popular now is it's a very compact uh, achievable and sort of easy for people to pick up they don't need a massive workshop you don't need a massive array of tools you know most of the tools will fit inside a pencil case and you can take them anywhere with you and the amount and size of timber that you need as a raw material is almost gatherable on a walk down a little footpath um, you can do a bit of footpath maintenance and any overhanging wrenches you know, take, a, take a little branch off and you'll be happy or follow a local tree surgeon around and grab a few branches off him before he puts them all through the chipper. Um, and it's 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 small and compact and it only takes probably if you really get into it, it might only take you an hour and a half to make a spoon. Um, and you can engrave it and make it as elaborate as you want. Um, I see the handle, I see they put a bit of a hole in it, put a bit of cardboard in it. What's yep. the best way that it's done? The easiest way to to do it rather than doing it with a knife because that can be quite tricky and dangerous and more tendency for it to split is if you buy you can just use a normal conventional twist drill but you'll find that they have a tendency to break out yeah. the other side so you can get proper wood uh, drills that have got like a little center point and little spurs on the side and they make a much neater job of it but if you're drilling a hole always back it up on a piece of wood yeah. and drill all the way through and you'll find that you end up with a, a smoother finish if you are going to put a hole in it, sometimes it's worth putting it in just before you've finished it off. So if you do get any splinter in, you've got a little bit of wood just to clean up. Uh, but it's quite nice if you can hang them up or add a oh, bit of... A lot of them put it onto the rocks you see that yeah. another spoon. But it's quite nice because it adds another dimension to it because you can maybe make a bit of natural cordage yeah, out of a bit of nettle. Yeah. 
yeah. um, or bramble or whatever, and then you've got an added little a little bonus thing. But yeah, word of warning: once you start, it gets addictive. Yeah. Um, so don't come moaning to me when you've wasted a whole day and you've got a pile of shavings and a and a toothpick to show for it. It's nothing to do with me. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, it's good fun. Just think always: if I'm whittling, what happens if it this breaks? If that knife slips what's my safety what is the safety in that grasp that's going to stop me cutting you see some crazy uh you see some crazy cuts you oh, know, yeah. sort of like this end on. if that slips you're going to end up just going straight in your thigh so think of the worst case scenario if you're carving always have even just a little a little first aid kit with you so that you've got at least some plasters never carve late at night in the dark with a head torch you're asking for trouble and certainly don't uh, even though it's tempting to be sitting down drinking your 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 your, your nice uh, local brew uh, while whittling i'd stick to the cup of tea that's probably the safest bet really okay so hopefully that helps and it'll get you started sorry it wasn't the full-blown demo that it normally is but um yeah at least at least at least i haven't made too much mess in there okay Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you very much.